fucking rad. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Hell yeah. We're back. <laughs> we're back. Round round two, Dr. David E. Martin. And I'd say we're, we're you're in the house, but we're in we're in the house. We're yeah, in uh, the house. Mickey's studio here, which is phenomenal. Very cool. It is. We um had the opportunity to connect again. Uh, I'm not gonna dive into too far details with that connection, but um we got plenty to discuss. I want to really take a deep dive into a history lesson today. Yeah, beautiful. I had a great history lesson last night. And to my to my new understanding, that history did not start with the Constitution, and it didn't start 400 years before that. It started well before that. So yeah, please unpack that for us with uh, the state that we're in right now, with what we're up against, and where the, the seeds have been planted that have led us here. Yeah, well, if you remember back at Obama's inauguration— uh, one of the very fascinating stories that people obsessed about was whether he was going to take the oath of office on a Bible. There was some talk about using Jefferson's copy of the Quran. Like there was this whole spin about what what was the oath of office going to be taken on. And when people started talking about Jefferson and the Quran, a lot of a lot of people across America went, "What the heck is Jefferson's relationship?" to Islam, what, what's the obsession about the Quran? And it turns out that historically, for some mysterious reason, Jefferson actually had a Quran. And, and when he sold all of his books in bankruptcy a couple times to finance his wine obsession back in the early 1800s, um, he, he would never part with that thing. And he would never part with a couple other interesting Persian texts, which fascinated people because here's a guy who, who collected amazing volumes. I mean, if you look at his bills of sale from book collections he got in France that all informed the founding documents of this country. It was always fascinating to me and to a lot of other people that for some reason he kept Persian texts and he kept Islamic texts as part of the part of his collection that he would never part with. So that kind of had this little vignette during the Obama run up to the inauguration, you know, what Jefferson thing is, is Obama going to try to, to co-opt? But, you know, the funny thing is people don't look at the fact that that really probably one of the seminal, do- seminal documents, and, and in Jefferson's world, it was actually his seminal work, which was the Statute of Religious Freedom, which is a very interesting document if we go back and look at the Virginia Statute, which is, which is probably one of Thomas Jefferson's most crowning achievements. And we look at the historical context of what that came out of. That came out of one and a half centuries of immigrants coming from Europe, largely, to America, and we talk about this as a place of tolerance and freedom and all that kind of stuff, but the fact of the matter is most of the immigrants that were coming during that 16, 1700s period were actually religious zealots. We could think about them as the kind of Christian Taliban. These are re- religious zealots who are coming to America and, and setting up these little enclaves, you know, in Boston and, you know, in Philadelphia and places like that. These are people who were oppressed in Europe, and they were coming over here not to set up tolerance. I mean, how, how quickly we forget we were burning witches in Salem, right? This was not <laughs> like, oh, let's all get along. Let's have potlucks. Let's hang out together. These were people who were not nice people. They didn't have the coexist uh, <laughs> this is buggy not, sticker. This is not, <laughs> yeah, it, it's not all of the thing. So, so the funny thing is when Jefferson says, hey, one of the most important things to do at the beginning of this republic is— Let's make sure there's a statute of religious freedom, which ensures tolerance. What people didn't pay attention to was he was plagiarizing somebody else's document and the somebody else's document. And and he was open about this. When I say he was plagiarizing it, he really was. It was like, I'm going to take something out of history and I'm going to use that something out of history. He was taking the Hammurabi Code, which is thousands of years old. And he said, hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? So he was taking that, principle that comes out of Persia and saying, hey, why don't we build a country where tolerance lives? And most people have no idea that somewhere in Bible school, somewhere across a pulpit, they heard the story, which gave rise to that. And they've never put two and two together because the story that gave rise to the principle of religious tolerance and tolerance is not putting up with somebody else's crap. I mean, that's how we use the term right now. I'm tolerating you. I'm putting up with you. But tolerance, once upon a time, was respect for different perspectives. It was actually knowing where somebody else was coming from, knowing how to engage with that person, 
you know, understanding their art, understanding their culture, understanding their food, understanding the language, understanding their traditional practices. That's what tolerance used to be. It was how do I make sure I don't accidentally offend you? How do I make sure that I don't accidentally, you know, step wrongly on your land or or use a resource that was, you know, sacred in your world and I didn't care about it in mine? Yeah, if I go to Japan and I have tattoos, I'm going to cover those up with, yeah. a, with a suit or something and, and, like that. And, and you're doing it not because you, you know, not because you're ashamed of it, not because you don't value your own experience. It's, hey, you want to engage in a respectful way. So that that's the old school what tolerance was. The story that that comes from is the story of the book of Nehemiah. And now I've just shocked everybody. And they're like, what the heck does Nehemiah have to do with the founding of the United States? Well, everything. Because that story is a really interesting one. And we don't tell the story very well. Because Nehemiah is the bodyguard to the most despotic king in probably history. One of the Xerxes or one of the cousins of the Xerxes. These guys are genocidal, homicidal, rape and pillage, like, these are the worst dudes that we can imagine, right? In the movie 300, it's the God King. It's that. That's the guy. And God's prophet is the bodyguard to that guy. Now, think about what I just said. Apparently, God wanted that guy's life protected. We actually don't have a framework in the way we tell our stories that says, yeah, let's go ahead. Let's, let's have the bodyguard to Hitler be the guy we most celebrate. As a matter of fact, we celebrate guys who tried to bump off Hitler, but we don't actually have a picture in our mind where we can say, oh, here's a dude whose actual job is to make sure that this horrible human being has his life protected. And the story in Nehemiah says that he enjoyed his job. This is a bodyguard, right? His job was to taste the food that was likely going to be poisoned by the myriad of people who want to kill the dude. His job is to taste the food to make sure it isn't poison. That's a crap job. And he did it joyfully. So far, I'm breaking down all of the story because one day he walks into the king's presence and his face is downcast, according to the book. Right? Now, if you're a bodyguard and you show up one day looking like you're a little off, bad career move, right? Because there's a couple explanations for what could be going on and all of them are bad. Maybe you did get poisoned and you're about to keel over and die, so that's a bad thing. Maybe you've decided that the guy's a real jerk and you want to off him, so you're kind of off. But the funny thing is, he was so good at his job and he was so loyal and he showed up in such a great way that the king, rather than suspecting foul play, said, Nehemiah, man, what's wrong? You're my man. You're my bubbles guy. You're, you're the guy that keeps things going. What's off with you today? And Nehemiah says, I'm sad. I'm sad because my people are without their country. My people are without their homeland. My people don't have their temples and their city walls and their houses, and they don't have all these things. And the king says to Nehemiah, then go take the treasury and rebuild your land. And he doesn't just do it to Nehemiah's people. The story of history is the Persian Empire funded the resurgence, the renaissance of religion, culture, faith, everything else by doing what? By going back and allowing people to live in liberty and tolerance. And that moment in history was so profound that the Hammurabi Code, the principle of absolute tolerance, was written into human law as a thing that says the only capital crime under Cyrus the Great was intolerance. And you heard what I just said, the only capital crime. They absolutely had no tolerance for intolerance, right? If you were not willing to show up and respect another person, if you were not willing to show up and honor other people's values, you weren't part of the community anymore and it was a capital crime. You lost your head. What I love about that story is if we actually understood the meaning behind the energetics of that story, we'd understand why Jefferson said, if we're going to have the American experiment, we need to rip from the, history book of life, this amazing story that said we are going to build a more perfect union, but we're only going to get there if we build a system that only one time in human history had been tried, which was the Persian Empire, which is can we honor your culture, 
can we honor your language? Can we honor your practices? Can we honor those things? And can we make it the statute of the land that says that we fundamentally respect each other's rights to life, to liberty, the pursuit of happiness, to beliefs, to values, to culture? Can we do it? Jefferson carved that cornerstone in the foundation of America. And we then conveniently forgot it. And so the reason why the history lesson is so important is if we want to get to a more perfect union, if we want to get to a country worthy of our pride, worthy of our honor, worthy of our respect, then we have to go back to that founding cornerstone and say, what are we doing right now to show up in the spirit that says, my place has been broken down, my cities have been burned, my people have lost their identity, and I want to bring it back. I want to bring back culture, values, morals, beliefs. I want to bring back the things that make us rich as human beings. Absolutely. Man. So there, 3,000, 4,000, <laughs> 5,000 years of history all in the first 10 minutes. Boom. <laughs> Let's drop in, baby. <laughs> We're here. Yeah, I mean, immediately, I think, uh, it, it, I don't mean to be fucking Captain Obvious, but and this is, this goes beyond politics, it goes beyond division, it goes beyond anything. Just looking at the current state of the world, how far off we are from yeah. that understanding. Yeah. Well, and see, the funny thing is, like, if, you're, if you look at what the Chinese Communist Party has been doing since 1999, since they decided to join the World Trade Organization, and basically, their accession into the World Trade Organization was the last major block to fall in a very, very, very long story, which probably is 12 to 1400 years old. And that story is that once upon a time, we were known by our ethnic groups, our language groups, our cultural historical heritage groups. That's, that's how we were really defined. And then idiots came along and said, I'm king of this, or I'm lord of that, or I'm this or that or the other thing. And so we we put these little fiefdoms and little monarchies in place and you know, the Catholic Church in Italy and, and the, the, you know, the Orthodox Church in Constantinople said, well, no, it's really about, you know, faith or, you know, the, the Islamic community said, no, it's about Mecca or Medina or whatever else. So what we did was we kind of had this hodgepodge for about a thousand years of maybe you are who you believe. Maybe you are what you speak or your language or your culture, or your food or your, you know, natural tendencies. And then we got this really weird idea, which is let's go ahead and draw lines. Let's call this Germania. And then let's call this other thing something else. And so we started drawing lines and we started fighting on where the line should be. Is it the river? Is it this side of the river or that side of the river? Is it that side of the mountain range or this side of the mountain range? And we started drawing these stupid lines. And then we started saying inside of these lines, everybody has to be the thing that we call them. So this is Swiss. Well, is Switzerland really northern Italy or is it really southern Germany? Eh, it's Switzerland now. Well, okay. Tell the mountain people who thought they were the only unconquered tribes of the Roman Empire. Tell them that they're basically the same as the guys that rolled over in Germania. And then wonder why they don't get along perfectly, <laughs> right? Go to Africa and just start drawing lines. Like, I'm going to draw that thing. What's that? It's Libya. What, what was Libya? You know, I got an idea. You know, that part of the, the African continent that kind of sticks out in the Indian Ocean. Let's just go ahead and slice up tribal lands and, and call it Ethiopia. Well, that works if you're in Europe. But if you're in Eritrea, you go, why the hell did you draw that line around that neighborhood? Right? The problem is we started drawing lines on maps, and that was a bad idea because what we did was we put people together not by their natural tendencies to get together. We put people together because we said so, right? We used the cunning use of the flag and the cunning use of colored lines on maps to go, this is who you are, this is to whom you belong. That's a bad idea, right? And it's a 1,200, 1,400-year-old kind of idea. It's a bad idea. And the problem with that idea is that we got to a place where it stopped working. And we had things called world wars, you know, first world war, second world war. And, and in our own lifetime, what happened in the Balkans, right? 
you know, once upon a time, Yugoslavia, once upon a time, the Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia. But then we had to break all those things apart, too. And in Africa, my gosh, how many times have we seen fights over what do we call it? You know, whose land is it? All this kind of stuff. The problem is the, the nation state model that said, let's draw lines on maps is a bad idea. And the Communist Party of China, when it decided to get into the World Trade Organization, I think delivered the death now to the idea of lines on maps. But they had to be co-opted by and co-opt at the same time the corporatocracy that said, we're going to alter the map based on supply chains. We are going to own the agriculture-rich areas of Africa. We are going to own the metals-rich areas around the world. We're going to own energy supplies. We're going to have a conflict in Myanmar, not about culture, but about a pipeline. We're going to, you know, we're going to have the Ukraine turn into this hot potato, which is really a fight between Austria and Russia, but we're going to make it about resources. And so what they did was they actually entered the World Trade Organization and as a part of that, started erasing lines on the map. Now, in the West and in Europe, what we've done is we've said, no, 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 lines are still important. I mean, Europe is kind of colored outside the lines a little bit with the European Union, but that's kind of erasing lines and kind of not erasing lines. But what happens is that when we lose the ability to have an identity based on the shapes that are put on the globe, and we start dropping into this weird space where alliances are based on the corporate deals that are cut in boardrooms, these are not elected officials making decisions. These are deals that are done expediently for commercial mercantile interests. We still prop up the illusion that somehow or another political systems are controlling a world. But the fact of the matter is all you have to do is look at the Chinese Communist Party Belt Road Initiative and you realize lines on maps don't mean anything to them. They could care less whether you're the Islamic Republic of Iran. If you have nuclear power, if you have zeolite to process oil, if you have things that they need, they go, cool, you do you. You do your Islamic thing. You keep that thing going and make it work. They can go to Africa and they can go, hey, we don't care what's going on with your neighborhoods and your communities. As long as you supply grain and as long as you supply cotton and as long as you supply materials, we could care less what you do. And they have made their conquest of the world this giant line erasure. But to do that, they had to figure out a way to take down the other story. Because if you're going to erase lines on maps, if you're going to make nation states irrelevant, you have to get people on side to that. So what you do is over a 10-year period of time, you become the supplier of everything. Technology, food, clothing. You become the supplier of everything. You build dependencies, and then you can start playing games with that. And I love the fact that we can sit here today in 2021 and we can talk about how the Chinese Communist Party has done all these kind of nefarious things in the last couple of years. But we failed to read that in 1986, the U.S. Office of Trade Policy made it a requirement for U.S. businesses to make sure they transferred their manufacturing capabilities and their technology to China as part of a Cold War strategy to make sure China didn't get a close affiliation with Russia. That's 1986. We're sitting here today going, how did China, you know, become what it is today? Well, um, you know, here's some bad news. We did it. And we did it to perpetuate a story, which was the Cold War story that came out of the Second World War. We wanted to make sure China's relationship was with us. And if you go to 1984, 1986, the Office of Trade Policy very explicitly said companies doing business in China must train their workers on their best technology, must train their workers on all the stuff that makes America great. That was our official policy. Guess what China did? They welcomed it. They took it on board. And now the alleged challenge that we face from China it's not of China's creation. It's our own creation. We did it to ourselves. Just like we decided to collaborate with them on the weaponization of the biosphere. We decided to collaborate with them on how to weaponize viruses. We decided to collaborate with them 
on how to weaponize biologics. And then we're shocked that the giant single shot, right? This is that Concord, New Hampshire kind of, you know, the shot heard around Concord, Massachusetts, the shot heard around the world. This is one of those funny moments where the bullet that was in the gun that was the shot that was heard around the world was a bullet we put in the gun. Right? So SARS-CoV-2, just like SARS-1.0, which was the one in 2003. We loaded the gun. And then we're wondering why we're bleeding out on the street. Right? There's no shock. We have failed, Kyle, in understanding our own complicity in our story of our own suffering. And part of the challenge that we all face right now is to start owning that, to start owning the fact that this didn't just happen, right? This wasn't a nefarious conspiracy of bad actors that set out to destroy us. We actually played along. Every time we went to Walmart and bought the shirt for $2.99, where you look at it and you go, I I I couldn't make that for five bucks. I couldn't make that for 10 bucks, right? Every time we bought something at Walmart, we loaded the gun. Right? Every time we decided we had to get Foxconn's newest release of the iPhone fill-in-the-blank number, we loaded the gun. And I'm not saying that there aren't nefarious actors who've taken advantage of the gun, but we loaded it. And I think that's why we have to do a careful examination of our own history to realize that if we want to actually move forward and have a better future, We have to learn not from the stories that we tell of the propaganda of the past. We actually have to learn from the past and realize that a series of incremental compromises, when we knew the right thing, right? We knew it was right to pay people a living wage. We knew that. And we decided if it was not paid in the U.S., but it was not paid in China, we're okay with the not paid in China version of that. Yeah, we want people to get a good wage here in America, but if we can get shoes cheaper and it's a sweatshop in Vietnam, we're down with that. Yeah, it's it's, it's an interesting thing to, to chew on because what we're potentially up against is a worldwide global open air prison system. Yeah. And we, we were happy when we were benefiting off of human slave labor. Yeah. And, and, Really, at the end of the day, with with I mean, like I'm not trying to be doom and gloom. I I I see a beautiful future, and I'm going to yeah. work towards that. I'm going to yeah. work my fucking ass off towards that, and I'll die doing that. At the same time, this is what we're up against. We're up against a potential total world government that yep. enslaves the masses. Yeah, well, and 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 I would say it kind of already is here. That's the weirdest part about it. I think I think what we're understanding right now is that we've been given these trinkets, right? We've given connectivity. We've been told that the world's like this beautiful playground where we're all interconnected, right? We can finally access the world's information because we have the first time. Listen, how many blowhards got up in conferences for the last two decades and gone, never in human history have people been so connected as the internet. Okay, pause. Let's just ask ourselves a question. When the U.S. Department of Defense and the intelligence agencies decided to fund Google, and I mean to fund Google, not to to partner with them, to actually make Google happen, do we really, really think that their giant intention was to liberate the concepts and the knowledge of the universe and put that at the fingertips of people? Or was there a possibility that the whole deal was to shut down the public library to make sure that we don't look at a multiplicity of, I don't know, books or newspapers or anything else? Is it possible that the reason why Google became a verb, right? Did you Google it? Is it possible that the reason why we did that is because we wanted to actually suppress information? Is it possible that the information age has actually had nothing to do with information? Is it possible that the networks that we've been told are our friends? Because we're getting free internet. We're getting free this. We're getting free that. Free social media. Well, are we? You know, this prison was built. And and then we walked in 
And then we actually closed the door behind us. And then we locked it. And then we tossed the key to the guard. And now we're wondering why we're in a prison cell. But the fact of the matter is, every one of those steps, you know, and we've been told for how long? Freedom isn't free? Well, free isn't freedom. We should flip the little paradox around here. Somebody paid for that. Somebody built that. Somebody brought us into that reality. And now we're sitting there going, oh, my gosh, we've lost free speech. Well, no, we didn't lose it. We gave it up. And we gave it up when we allowed a corporation to decide how to curate and how to permit or not permit the free flow of ideas. And we did it on the back of, yeah, but it came preloaded on my iPhone 10 and it was uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay, cool. That's you just justifying the width of the bars in your cell. We were in this prison for a long time. We're just seeing it now. And now the question is, okay, cool. Like Plato's cave, you know, we're chained to the wall. A couple of us are starting to go, I remember that there's a shaft that goes out of the cave that gets into the light. And the question is, if we go up into the light and we go experience that, what it really means to live at liberty, what it really means to live in a world where we honor and respect and engage in tolerant ways with other individuals, are we willing to go up there realizing that the people who are in the cave actually are going to defend the cave? That's the weird shit of that allegory, right? It's the people who actually emancipate themselves who become the enemy of the enslaved. And by the way, I wish that was a metaphor today. But that's what we're living with. But if it made it into Plato's Republic, right? So, I don't know, two and a half thousand years ago, 2,000 years ago. If it made it into Plato's Republic, I have nothing but optimism. Because if Plato warned us of that a couple thousand years ago, that means that was going on then too. And the cool thing is we're sitting here today having a conversation, which tells me something amazing about humanity, which is we've gotten to call the bluff on this bullshit before. And over and over and over and over again, the Renaissance, the Reformation, you know, the formation of the experiment of America, like all of these times, we as people have been able to call BS on the experiment and we've been able to get out of the cave and try something else. Now, we happen to have a new cave. This cave is the corporatocracy. This cave is the Chinese Communist Party erasing the nation state relevance and saying, hey, it's all about managing supply chains and that's what the future is about. Well, it turns out that's our cave now. And now our chance is to get out of the cave, go up into the light and realize that there's another way to live. So I look at the tragedy of this story and go, this just means we're at go time. We're at the starting line of the what will be the next. And I freaking love that idea. Like, how cool is it that we weren't, like, shoveling off at 87 or 88 or 92 or 105 right now? Like, how cool is it that we are the ones who get to live this? Like, I never even, you know, I go around in the world talking about this. Like, wouldn't it have been cool to be at the start of the Renaissance? Like the first time somebody said, ah, screw that mosaic. I'm going to paint a nude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, that would have been fun. Yeah, I was talking to Del Bigtree about that. The, the idea that, you know, if you're a freedom fighter or if you've ever considered yourself a warrior or if you if, if fucking any, any fire that lives within you. Yeah. If it's burning right now for a better world, what better time to be alive? That's exactly right. That's what vitality is. Vitality is actually perceiving the world that's around us and deciding inside of that world. Hey, guess what? I showed up. Like, I'm equipped to do what I'm doing. I'm here. I'm active. I'm engaged. I'm vital. I'm a couple of weeks away from 54. You know what? I feel so alive right now. I feel so ready for everything because I've seen things. I've been around the world. I've influenced the formation of governments. I've written founding documents. 
I've been the Thomas Jefferson to a couple places, right? I've been able to sit down and say, hey, you know what? We get to start go on a new country. What would you put into the ingredient list to actually build that? I've had that experience. What a cool place to be at 54 years of age, ready to go. And what else do I have? I freaking have my health. I'm married to the most amazing woman who absolutely adores me, and I freaking adore the, you know, the freaking air she breathes. I have a daughter who loves me. I have a son who's absolutely over the moon about our relationship. I have another daughter who's actually cutting her own way in this world and doing an amazing thing in a biotech company, making change. Like, what a freaking great time to be alive. I'm not watching this thing going, ah, I've got to count down. Do I have enough days to get shit done? Nope. I'm ready. It's go time. And I'm, I'm so loaded for this moment because the world and life and just amazing people, amazing people around the world have given me the opportunity to step through a door to say, hey, how about you come into this country, learn how you write a constitution? Oh, how about you come over here, figure out how to reappropriate resources? Oh, how about you come over here and help us figure out how we're going to organize what follows a despotic ruler? Like, I've had those experiences, which means I'm prepared for the now, which is awesome. There's a lot of people who aren't prepared for the now. Yeah. And... um some of them are waking up and they're seeing the writing on the wall yep. and they're, they're, they're wondering how they can get involved and how, how communities can form and what is the way forward. And a lot of our conversation last night um, circled around that. And I want to dive into that and then still recognizing as we do that, the majority will be the people that remain in the cave in yep. shackles that fucking see us as the enemy. Yeah. Period. It's already happening. It's been happening for the last year. Yeah. It, it's beyond virtue signaling. It's beyond social justice warriors. It's beyond cancel culture. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the, the crabs in a bucket, you know, or the, the lobsters in a bucket. Yeah. Not letting any of the top crab or top lobster escape. Well, so, you know, if, if we actually pull back some of the layers of the illusion, if we pause just for a second, And I mean, you and I just pause for a second and go, you were doing amazing things in 2018. You had an amazing career that was a career that was not something I was affiliated with and I didn't have familiarity with, right? So, you know, I think it's pretty self-evident when people look at me and they look at you, they go, one of us is a fighter and one of us isn't. But it turns out that the reason why we can sit together is that's actually not a true statement. I fought in different rings. Very different rings. Mine were jungles in South and Central America. Mine were war zones in the Pacific. I just did different fighting, but I I actually had to learn how to fight. I had to learn how to engage in oppositional combat such that you actually are preserved and you're not destroying your opponent You're actually just getting to the place where that particular conflict ends and there's a clear prevailing interest at the end of that conflict. That's what it's about. Now, why could you and I sit together where five years ago or 10 years ago, we might have not found that common thread? What I remind people of all the time is we have inside of every one of us, and I mean every one of us, we have something, which is actually pretty cool which is a memory of the thing that connects us rather than the thing that separated us. And I freaking love the last 15 months because it turns out that the last 15 months made our friendship possible. Fuck yeah. Because we would have lived in a world where you would have done your thing. And you know what? I have not done podcasts. I have not engaged in podcasts. That's a technology that I have not engaged. And it wasn't until somebody actually said, Kyle Kingsbury podcast, I finally listened to my first podcast. I have been a podcast in podcast form, I think, since 2011. I think the first person who made me cool was a guy named Todd Goldfarb. And the best part about the story is a funny-ass story because there's a really great guy, phenomenal thinker, beautiful mind, Ken Wilber, integral theory, like Colorado, you know, friggin' amazing. He's written tons of books, beautiful guy. 
Ken Wilber was scheduled to be on Todd Goldfarb's podcast. And then something came up. I don't know. Maybe it was his. He, he had some periods of illness or he had something. So the world, no kidding, in like 2011, the world tuned in to Todd Gold, Goldfarb's Worldwide Tipping Point podcast. And everybody was waiting to hear Ken Wilber's voice. And Todd got on and apologized that he had somebody who had to back clean up. Ken couldn't make it. So this guy, Dave Martin, that none of you have heard of, is going to be on the show. Now, Todd and I already had this cool relationship. And so, you know, but it was funny because I was introduced to the world of podcasting 100% by accident. And I mean, not by accident. Like, it was an accident. I, I wasn't even scheduled. And then, you know, here I am filling in for Ken Wilbur. Now, the funny thing is, if you look at that particular podcast in 2011, that podcast changed the course of my life. But even though it did, and listen to what I'm saying, even though that changed the course of my life, you know what I never listened to? I never listened to podcasts. <laughs> like here's a technology that literally altered my lived experience. I am married to Kim. We met in Antarctica, courtesy of that freaking podcast, because it was people who listened to that that put me in touch with the guy that's organizing the cruise that got us to Antarctica in 2015 where we met, blah, 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 blah. Like, I'm literally living daily with the artifact of, but for podcasts, I wouldn't be there. You think I listen to podcasts? No. Nah. Until you come along, we have our first conversation. I'm like, I got to listen to this guy. Because I was tired of having conversations that were the same freaking vanilla when did coronavirus get patented? When did this happen? When did that happen? When did something else happen? Because I didn't want to be typecast. And so I listened to you when I heard that there was a possibility we might do a, a, a podcast. I listened to you and I was like, I want to know whether I want to do a podcast with this guy because I want to know what he does. And it turns out that you're my gateway drug into listening to podcasts. Now, I tell you that because it's so important to realize that's what COVID gave us. Right, COVID gave us an opportunity, if we want to, to remember the pieces of our lives that we've glossed over and forgotten about, the skills that we had, the talents we had, the connections we had. And what we got to is an opportunity to get real, really fast. With there are people who are actually on the team that is the winning side of this history. And we are the winning side of this history. I already know that. Because we have not given ourselves over to the futility and the fatality and the, all the other crap that's going on. I would rather, as Kim always says, you know, die on your feet rather than live on your knees, right? That's where we want to be. That's always been the winning side of history. Now, whether we objectively as organic souls are the ones that make it to the end or not, who gives a shit? I actually know when history is written, I know that what we did last night is part of that. I know that we have actually made a difference. And the coolest part about that is now we found each other. Right across how many improbabilities. And freaking amazing. And if people actually realize that that's what we always have all wanted. We've always all wanted to remember that we matter. And even the people who are playing the game, you know, going along with the common narrative, going along with mainstream media, going along with all that, they desperately wish that they could have this conversation. They do. And likely miss seeing people, likely miss face-to-face -face connection, likely Absolutely. miss a lot of the things that we, you know, saw through the, the, the veil of and said, fuck all that. Yeah. We're having people over for Thanksgiving. Like, right. And every other fucking day, <laughs> yeah, exactly you know, right. like every other day we're going to have exactly people over. Right. We spoke last night about the founding of this country and there's, uh, you know, <laughs> excuse me, mixed reviews according to who you're talking yeah. to and where they're located on the planet. But we dove into the Constitution, what happened to it prior. Yeah. And, and then a lot about Texas and a lot about uh, what's in the Republic of Texas's Constitution. Yeah. And what that means for people. But- Really, and, and and speaking, you know, with a a Californian who won't be named, but but what she's up to with yeah. with really driving people back to the land, driving yeah. people back to yeah. communities, and you know, if you think of 
what we were absentmindedly going through each day with blinders on saying, oh, this is important. Oh, no, I got to do this now. I got to do that now. And we get forced into a pause. Hold on. Take a seat. Yeah. And then you have some of these freedoms just slowly being stripped away as we say yes to it. Yes, (laughs) keep me safe. Yes, keep me safe. What we see that is lost, which really isn't lost, we still have it, Yep, can be rebuilt and rebuilt better, more mindfully. Yeah to interconnect with each other and with the land. Right. So let, let, let's dive into that. Let's dive into some of the laws. Let's dive into the, some of the constitution and talk about this way going forward that is going to be 100% necessary if we hope to have any future for our kids, our grandkids, and seven generations beyond. Yeah, so it's going to be the bow tie speaking again. So I'm just tuning in. I got you, I got you. Bro. I you, got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so Pope Innocent III in the 13th century is where we're starting this story. Which is, of course, where everybody thought we'd go. And by the way, if you ever look in the background of my bookshelf, you see that I actually have a Pope Innocent III action figure. Seriously, <laughs> I do. They made an action like figure. a serious <laughs> action figure. I have a Pope Innocent III action figure. My favorite nefarious actor in, in human history. I just love the guy. He's he your super so, villain. He, he is a super villain. Like, I wake up every day going, I got you. I got you. So, but, but the reason why that's important is because you and I are familiar with Magna Carta. Not familiar with it, like we don't have a copy of it, you know, sitting on our kitchen counter. But we've heard of it before. We kind of know it has something to do with some agreement that was made to kind of let a king be a king, but let the lords be the lords and all that kind of stuff. So the Magna Carta was half of a document. And then there's another half of the document that no one talks about, which was the what was called the Charter of the Forest. Now, the Charter of the Forest was was an amazing document. And it was an amazing document because what it said was that even though the king had land and even though the deer in the king's forests were officially the deer, that the king could never deprive human beings of their right to live and their right to livelihood. And this is in the 13th century, right? So think about what I just said. There was a document written that actually said humans have a right to their lives and their livelihoods. Now, here's the bad news. Pope Innocent III declared it null and void, and so it got wiped out pretty much eight months into its existence. Super villain. H- humans, humans have had like eight months in 2,000 years where they actually had the right to live. Let me just say that again, because I don't think we think about this. The right to live has only been granted to humans in a document for eight months out of the last 2,000 years. If that doesn't cut you to the core, you're not human. Because what we have is pursuits of and the management of, but essentially this thing we call life has been carved up with easements. You're entitled to do this, but not that. You're entitled to do this, but not that. Even when we talk about what should be fundamental human rights, they're not fundamental human rights. Right. UN charters and declarations and everything else are aspirational statements. There is no government on earth right now, no government on earth that actually recognizes the sovereignty of life. Which is about as screwed up a statement as anybody can make. And then what we do is we run around going, well, back in 1776, back in 1774, the First Continental Congress, Back in 1780, 89, blah, 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 blah. We, we come up with all these stories that we want to tell about, well, oh, we had the founding documents. We had the Bill of Rights. Okay, let's pause for a second. I've asked tons of people around the world if they could actually end the sentence of what the Tenth Amendment of the Constitution is. The end of the Bill of Rights. And it turns out, in graphic relief, every single thing that's happened to us over the last now 14 or 15 months has been in direct contravention to the 10th Amendment. I've not heard a judge. I've not heard a lawyer. I've not heard a pundit. I've not heard anybody except me point out that the 10th Amendment, which enumerates the rights inside of of the Constitution, says that if rights have not been enumerated in the Constitution, they are then the province of the state, and then the sentence ends, or the people. Tell every spineless governor 
Tell every unelected public health official. Tell every single judge, jury, political, unpolitical, you name the person. Tell every one of them that the Tenth Amendment says that the buck stops with the people's interest. And they'll go, oh, no, 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 no. The Tenth Amendment gives the state's rights to have police powers. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It actually says that if the rights were not enumerated in the Constitution, they are reserved ultimately with the last three words of the Tenth Amendment or the people. In other words, we couldn't write our right to life into our Constitution for all kinds of reasons. The biggest reason is we didn't hold truths to be self-evident. All men weren't created equal because it turns out we had an asterisk next to all men are created equal. And what we meant was all men of European extraction that had a certain, you know, geopolitical relevance in terms of their historical upbringing, that had a certain socioeconomic standing, that had a certain other thing. Those are the all men we meant are created equal. We didn't mean, you know, First Nations people. We didn't mean immigrants that came from the wrong parts of the world. We didn't mean slaves. We didn't mean this. We didn't mean that. So all men weren't created equal. We actually had the approved list of who was created equal and then the all others. So that's that was a problem. But if you go back and you then ask the question, okay, we didn't believe it. We didn't write it into our documents. Our founding documents do not guarantee the right to life, the right to livelihood. So it's very easy to have a Governor Newsom come along or Governor Abbott come along or Governor Northam come along and go, well, you're non-essential. Therefore, you can't earn a livelihood. Well, turns out that's because they didn't read the end of the 10th Amendment. Because the end of the 10th Amendment says all rights ultimately flow back to the benefit of the people. And if it isn't written into the Constitution, if it isn't written into the Bill of Rights, all the remaining rights, and it doesn't say some of them, all of them belong to the people. So while we didn't make the right to life and livelihood a constitutional right, what we did in the 10th Amendment is say, we do have them. But how many people have even read the 10th Amendment? How many people have even bothered to look at the founding documents and go, hold on a minute. The thing that's playing out in front of us is actually not the thing that is the rules that we agreed to. We don't have politicians. We don't have lawyers. We don't have Anybody who's actually playing to what is, in fact, in the founding documents. I talked about this a couple of weeks ago on another broadcast. Second Amendment. The Second Amendment is, in fact, an amazing piece of literature because it says that as a citizen, you are accountable to hold your government accountable. That's what the Second Amendment says. And it turns out that there's a tiny little utility <laughs> that's actually helpful in holding the government accountable. Right? The Second Amendment is a beautiful document that says, hey, guess what? We think that it's important for you to have the right to bear arms, but it's not the right to bear arms as a property, right? It's a right to bear arms because you have a responsibility to defend this country's values against tyranny. That's what the Second Amendment's about. And people think of, they've been trapped into the story. Well, it's a right to own a gun. No, it's the right to be a patriot. It's the right to be responsible and accountable. And it turns out that one of the utilities of that happens to be a firearm. That's what the Second Amendment's about. But how many of us have actually been fooled into the belief that it's somehow just a property right to say, I have a right to own a gun? No. You have a right to show up, to be a person who actually defends the values of this country. That's what you have a right to. We don't read that. We don't have those conversations. And I can guarantee you that 99.9% .9 of gun owners love what I just said. Because yes, it is a right that says I have the right to bear arms, but I do want to defend the things that matter to me. I do want to defend the values. And you can't read the Second Amendment and the end of the Tenth Amendment without looking at each other going, hey, guess what? We have let ourselves down. We failed to read the end of the Tenth Amendment. We let police powers and we let governors have police state powers. We let this stuff happen. And our own founding document 
gave us the roadmap not to make it happen. The state of Texas, section one of the, the first article of the Constitution of Texas, which the longest constitution and the most amended constitution in America. Beautiful statement that says, hey, guess what? Independent state of Texas is, in fact, independent. That's what it says. And it also says the only law that can govern the state of Texas from the national sense is the U.S. Constitution. Now, what I just said would come as a shock to probably most people sitting in the state house in Texas. Because they've been sold a bill of goods that says, oh, no, no, no. What we really mean is that plus the Commerce Clause and that plus interstate this and that plus defense that and this plus immigration that or Department of Homeland Security that. No. The Constitution of Texas, one of the most beautiful documents written for the celebration of the life and liberty and pursuit of happiness of human beings. That Constitution actually says there's only one law that the national government has any right to do anything with. And the only law that is, is the U.S. Constitution, which means all these bullshit proclamations that have come down in the last 14 months, any one of them that's been taken on by any elected official in the state of Texas is being done in violation of the Constitution of Texas. The only way you can know that is to actually know what the hell is in the Constitution of Texas. And what we did last night and what I keep doing all over the place is saying, people, we already have the tools that we need. Like, we have them. The fact that we don't know we have them is not someone else's fault. It's our responsibility. It's our duty as a citizen. It's our duty as a patriot to understand that every single one of those rights belongs ultimately to the people. And the Constitution and the Bill of Rights are absolutely clear. If it didn't make it in, to the Constitution, and if it didn't make it into the first 10 amendments, the rest of it belongs to us. Which means, Kyle, you and I have the right to life. We have the right to liberty. We have the right to the pursuit of happiness. We have the right to our livelihoods. We have the right to have freedom of assembly. We have the right to all of those things. And it's only us walking away from that of our own volition that robs us of those things. Yeah, I'm reminded of, uh, I know I've brought this up on the podcast before, but still, if you haven't seen it recently, V for Vendetta. Yeah. You know, when he, when he takes over the singular news station, there's one TV channel in all of England at yeah. that point. Yeah. Right? Sound familiar? Yeah. One fucking news source. Yep. And he's on, V is on all the stations and he says, you're going to ask yourself, who caused this? Yeah. Who was to blame? Why did this happen? And he said, take a hard look in the mirror. We have all said yes. Yep. In some way, shape, or form. You know, I realize you got the bow tie on, so I'm not going to stretch or push the limits. And for those that can't read Dude, between can. the lines, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, we, we got much of David's opinion last night, which was fan fucking tastic. And obviously, there is a different level that you bring to recorded audio. And I'm going to honor that. And for all the fucking reasons, you should do that. Yeah. Right. Like with, with what you've been saying uh, <laughs> far p- prior to pandemic indoctrination, <laughs> but, but obviously through all of this, no question, let's hold that. I want to shift into what are the ways that we reconnect, you know, and, you know, people have this idea where we got to throw out everything that's happening right now and try to relive like the old, you know, yeah. I told my sister about this community that I was into and, and potentially going to be a part of. And she's like, great, you're going to be a fucking Amish. You know, you're, right. you're going to show up, you're going to have a beard. You're going to be turning your own butter, making wooden chairs. And I'm like, no, we, I love technology. Yeah. I love the things that we have. I yeah. love the gifts of where we're at, but I also don't want to be dependent on it. Yeah. I don't want to be dependent upon a grid. Yeah. I want to be interconnected with that, but sovereign from it. Right. Talk about some of the ways that we, form together some of the things that are necessary to create the earth we want to live in and leave for our children. Yeah. So it probably would have been really shitty to be Noah in the 35th year. Right? It would have been shitty. Because the ark is most of the way built. It's kind of like, you know, it's finishing by the time you get 35 years into 40 years. And, and you know, and there's a jackrabbit that ran by it, but you know, no elephants, no giraffes, just a jackrabbit. 
And at some point, Noah's probably sitting there going, it damn well better rain. Like, it really better rain. And like animals better show the fuck up. Because if that doesn't happen, I've got a big RV that doesn't have wheels. Like, that would have been a pretty rough, rough time. And somewhere around the 38th or 39th year, like, you can only do so much to make the window hinges work on the ark. I don't know if you remember, but like, Hinges weren't really invented back then, so you got to figure out how to let doves out and shit like that. I, so you have to make an aviary so that you can do that shit. So, like, and, and the raven, and sanitation, whatever. sanitation. Yeah. You're sitting there going, I forgot how much elephant shit because I've never seen an elephant. So you got a bunch of stuff that you're just kind of doing the final touches on, and, and and then and then you start seeing clouds, and you go, all right, all right, that's cool. And then for the first time across the whatever the plane of whatever you are on, you know, where you're building this thing with gopher wood, like, I don't even know what gopher wood is, but it sounds cool. Um, like, all of a sudden, you look over there and you see these giant gray things with big ears and you go and shit's going down. That's like, okay, I'm not, I don't even know what those things are, but they're walking towards this boat. And then. And then these tall, long neck things start walking towards the boat. And then all of a sudden, these weird-ass birds that have giant plumage start walking towards the boat. And you start going, this is getting real. I love that story because I love what it takes to actually step back and go, where are we going? Because each one of us has to think of our arc, right? We, we've been told that we're the most interconnected species in our own, you know, evolution right now. Because we all have these clever devices and, you know, and they, we don't even know what happens. Do we really know what a cell tower is and a satellite is? I don't know. Do we? I don't think we do. I don't think we know why it is that I can actually go on my, you know, my Facebook messenger. I can hit video dial and and in an in instant, I'm, I'm looking at the face of my dear friend Amanda in, in you know, Queensland, Australia. Like, I don't even think that's a voodoo shit. How that happens. I don't know. Did it go to a tower and then a satellite and then go, you know, through a time hole and whatever? Because I'm having a conversation with her and she's 13,000 miles away and I'm having a conversation with her. And it actually feels so connected that I'm like, I, I'm, I'm, we're not cutting out. It's not like over. And then 10 minutes later, wait, wait, over. Wait. Right. It's not that. It's like we're going. So what we have is we have this illusion that we've built. It says that's what connection is. And we've had this illusion built that says technology has to be plugged into a wall and, you know, this, that, and the other thing. Here's the problem with all that. You can't build an arc with an iPhone. You know, you can't build an arc with a podcast or YouTube or a video or anything else. You actually have to know something about the way the world works. And unfortunately, what's happened is we've divorced ourselves from knowing how the world works. Now, you bring up Amish. I grew up in my high school years in southern in southeastern Pennsylvania, on a you know old order Mennonite community, you know these hands have milked cows. That's you know old school. Um, so I come by the bow tie and the boots honestly. Like I legitimately have you know horses and cows, and you know we thrashed wheat with horse drawn thrashing machines. Like old school, right? I used to wear a straw hat. Go figure. Um, but here's the funny thing about that period. The Amish and the Mennonite actually realize that if you need power, you actually figure out what you need to do. But you need something to spin, you use the wind. You need something to spin at a flywheel pace, you use horse. You know, you need more power, you use steam, right? So it turns out that, that the reason why their communities were resilient is because they were never dependent. Listen to what I just said. They were resilient because they were never dependent. They knew that if you need water, you know, you have a stream flowing, you can put a water wheel in. You know, the fact of the matter is we, we have been trained out of being aware of our surroundings. How much sun do we have? Does solar make sense here? You know, does wind make sense here? Does geothermal make sense here? Well, to make those questions relevant, we first have to understand where we are. And Kyle, what we've done is we've separated ourselves from the intelligence of the universe that's around us. We've separated ourselves from the intelligence of the land and the water and the wind and the weather patterns and all that kind of stuff. 
and and then we wonder why we're subject to the oh my god what happens if the power goes out right when the snowstorm hit texas what happens when the power go out becomes a question because we only know that power comes from the little thing we plug in the wall well it doesn't power comes from all kinds of sources but we've been conditioned and habituated over the last century and a half to saying no 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 if it's not metered it doesn't count well, the giant emancipation of human existence is to realize that the technology that we have right now, all the communications technologies, all the internet technologies, all the how-to YouTube videos, everything else, we should be applying to saying, how do we make ourselves resilient? Because the time is not coming. It's already here where we have put ourselves in line of single point failure dependencies, where if the power goes out, real people die. Because we haven't figured out how to remember how to heat a place. You know, real people die because we haven't figured out that health is not about being on life support. Health is about being healthy, right? We've lost touch with what it means to actually live, and therefore we put ourselves in line to die. What I think we need to be doing right now, all of us need to be doing, is getting really clearly in touch with the land that we're in. I said on a video not long ago, very simple exercise. Right now, you're listening to this. You're watching it. Right now, get a map. And I mean a map. I mean like an old school physical map, not, not Google Earth. Get a map and ask yourself, how far are you from your power station? How far are you from a military base? Now, why would I ask those two questions? Turns out that when shit goes down, your proximity to a military base has a high degree of probability of how resilient your grid is right now. Because it turns out that we prioritized from Rumsfeld forward, we prioritize making sure that base operations can continue. So the further you are, the more at risk you are. Now, that doesn't mean a good or a bad thing. It just means know it. Where are you? If you're a long way away, ask yourself the question, do you know where the closest artesian spring is? Now, you're going to have to Google the word artesian. What does that mean? Well, that means a spring that comes out of the ground. Why is that important? Well, water that comes out of the ground is less likely to be contaminated than water in a stream that's gone across and collected shit from all over the world, right? So do you know where the closest artesian spring is? 99.9% .9 of the population probably doesn't even know what the word is. And then a fraction of that population actually knows where the closest one is. Why would that be important? Well, I don't know. Maybe if a municipal water system went down, it'd be a damn good idea to know where clean water was. Right? And if you don't know where clean water is, do you know how to actually build a filter? Because it turns out that some of the most important technology is actually pretty damn easy. Clay, charcoal, stone, we can do a lot with what we have. But what we can't do is we can't wait for the event to happen that necessitates those things to come into our existence. We actually have to be consciously prepared that says, hey, you know what? If I'm not living in a place where I have the ability to grow food or get clean water or whatever else, I need to know how to get there. And if I'm relying on some sort of intermediary where I have to get the National Guard to ship in bottled water, I'm in a fragile space. If we want to fragile proof our existence, we have to stop thinking that the only way to do that is through metered existence. Now, that's a concept, but I want to unpack that. Metered existence, what does that mean? That means stuff that we pay utility bills for. Like, ask the question, if that utility fails, what do I do? Most of us don't have an answer. Most of us don't. We need to, ha we need to have an answer. If I don't have the HEB or whatever your grocery store is, your Whole Foods, if you you know, can tolerate the mask policy, those assholes, right? You know, whoever that is, wherever that is, if I don't have access to that, where would I get nutrition? Now, you know, sitting here in the freaking outskirts of Austin, Texas, I'd get a gun and shoot some of these fuzzy things that are running around because there's a heap of them. So I'd have venison for a long, long, long damn time just in the backyard of this house. Um, but, you know, where are you going to go for food? Where are you going to go for these things? The problem that we have is we're not thinking resiliently. We, we don't, we're not trained on it. We're not having those conversations. And it's not doomsday preppers. I'm not talking about, you know, building a bunker and filling it with you know, tins of, of baked beans. 
or if you Alex, want to do Alex that, Alex Jones freedom meals. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you know, if you want to do that, I'm not having a go at it. I mean, I think having some resilience is a good idea, but at the end of the day, that's not the answer. The answer is: Are you capable of moving into a space where, independent of a metered life, can you thrive? And that conversation is a conversation we all should be engaging. Because it turns out that's a conversation that even down to the selection of where Kim and I live. I have four springs that come out of the ground at the top of a hill. You know why I picked that spot? Because I have four springs that come out of the top of a hill. You know what I know can't be done to that water? Nobody can fuck with it. Because it's coming out at the top of a hill which means it won't get sediment in it. It won't get contamination in it. You can't biologically harm it because it turns out it keeps running. So even if you tried to harm it, it would just wash itself out. That's how I chose to choose where I'm living. That's a conscious decision that says, how do I make my life a resilient, vibrant, and productive, not just survive? I'm not interested in surviving. You know that. You're not interested in surviving. We're interested in thriving. We're interested in saying, yeah, things may go crazy and may be difficult. I want to party through the war. I don't want to just sit there and make it through surviving. I want to thrive. Absolutely. Yeah, that's tons to chew on. Tons to chew on. Yeah, I'm thinking about a lot of these things. And, you know, the coming from different backgrounds, but both of a war archetype, both fighters, you know, it's it's uh, it's something that was said to me through you know podcasts with Rob Wolf and listening to different people talk about you know it, the necessity of preparing for a long winter, yeah. things like that, like not building a bunker and those kind yep. of things, but like yeah, everyone prepped year after year for a long winter because it was just good fucking housekeeping. Yeah, there was no other reason than like yeah. I'm going to be intelligent. Yep. And not let shit hit the fan and say yep. hey I'm out of water I'm out of this I'm ex- I'm out of all these things. The preparation for these things actually affords a freedom from within. Like meditation creates space from That's within. Exactly right. Yoga opens the body. And even without changing my schedule, I don't feel held down by yeah. the amount of work that I have to yeah. do. Right? Yeah. If I start to set the table for one possible outcome and that op- outcome never comes. Like I'm Noah there yep. at 38 and I'm like, man, there's no clouds here. <laughs> right? If I'm that guy… I still don't have to worry about any it's of that exactly because right. the ark is built. It's exactly right. And, and you know, it's funny, and I'll use another Old Testament biblical metaphor just because it's a good one. You know, we know the story of Joseph, but we don't know the story of Joseph because Joseph is in prison, forgotten by the two dudes he helped get out, which really sucks. I mean, <laughs> you know, you spring two guys and, and then you're left. But he's forgotten. And then, you know, the Pharaoh has his dream and he's got the fat cows and the skinny cows. and He's got the fat wheat and the skinny wheat. And he's sitting there kind of doing this thing. And he gets all the smart guys to come in and he goes, OK, what's going on with my dream? Because obviously Pharaoh thinks that there's something about the dream that's important. They can't figure shit out. And so they the, the dude that's, you know, the baker is going, oh, I remember this guy. And, and I remember that he actually was good at interpreting dreams. And so all that. And, and so what happens is they get him there and he goes into the, you know, the seven fat cows are going to be there seven years of abundance and then there's going to be seven famine years. And the funny thing about the story, I, I, I love the fact that the, the story of Joseph in Egypt is oddly enough, the story of the first Federal Reserve. I don't know if you know that, but it turns out exactly the sequence of events, you know, change the gold standard, which is what he does first get all the production, which is how he does short-term commodities, and then builds essentially a series of contingencies where he shortens duration of assets. What he does in the seven years of plenty is he stores up stuff, and he stores up a lot of stuff, but not enough stuff because he knows that he's not going to be able to store grain for seven years, but he gets enough stuff, and he starts changing people's diet. You know, the first paleo diet came in 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 that thing because they did go through their bread years, but then it went into the animals. So like, it was actually kind of cool. If you actually read that story through the lens of just inquiring what's going on, it actually tells you what you need to do to get ready for things. We don't read that story that way. And that's a shame because it's written right in front of our faces. Like it's there. We can actually look at it and go, oh, 
You mean so different phases of famine is going to change your own nutrition and it's going to change your metabolic system. It's going to do all those things. Why don't we actually read right out of the, you know, text that we ignore? The, that's the blueprint to how to survive. But the funny thing about Joseph is they don't just survive, right? His family comes somewhere in the middle of the famine. They show up, they go through their little craziness. A lot of, you know, mommy issues and daddy issues and shit to work out, you know, some shit brothers and, you know, who doesn't have those? But the fascinating thing is during that whole period of time, they're thriving. And they're thriving not because they had the biggest warehouse and they're not thriving because they had some sort of advantage. They're thriving because they thought through how to be ready to thrive through whatever came. Once again, five and a half years into that whole seven years of plenty, how many people are going, <laughs> whack job conspiracy theorist, blah, blah, blah. What an asshole. He's sucking up to Pharaoh. He's getting all this stuff. He's got the signet ring. He's running around. He's got a cool title, Grand Vizier. What a freaking great title. He's going around. What a blowhard. And then stops raining. The Nile stops flooding. Shit starts falling apart. And now all of a sudden, conspiracy theorist over here, for seven years, by the way, remember that. All of you who feel like you're victimed by the, oh, people don't like my posts on Facebook. Well, suck it. You got another six years coming <laughs> before you get to be the guy going, yep, told you so. But the cool thing about that story is you go through the story and you start saying, oh, hold on a minute. That's just a roadmap. It's just another roadmap. And to your point, if I am prepared, there's no downside to being prepared. Right? If I know where my water is, I know how to get power. I know how to get basic things done. Listen, I've got a problem. You have to walk into my garage and you can see it. One of them's motorized. Seven of them aren't. But I've got bikes. I got a lot of bikes. I ride a lot. I stay in shape with my bikes. I'm constantly on the go. You know what I'm going to be able to do? I'm going to be able to travel. And everybody who's telling me, oh, no, you're not, because they might even shut down gas stations. You know what I'm going to do when I'm going past gas stations? Be prepared. Like, I'm preparing this thing, this engine, to say, you can take my gas pump away. Do it. And watch me still get to Austin, Texas. Like, we're, we've got to think, not some sort of victim, how do we survive? How do we hunker down? How do we doomsday prep? How do we this? How do we that? No, bullshit. How do we thrive? Because it turns out, because I am prepared for a world that may not involve hydrocarbons going into my car, I'm in great shape. Because every freaking day of the world, I'm on my bike, and I'm getting fit, and I'm staying vital, and I'm keeping my body in form. Why? Because I'm ready for anything. It's a simple thing to do. And you know what? The best part about it is as a person prepared, like you just said, with meditation, with yoga, breath work, whatever it is, whatever you're doing, if you can see yourself as preparing yourself to be ready for every day, not some sort of shit day when the world falls apart, be prepared for every day. Because then every day happens and you're never surprised. And you're never caught flat-footed and you're never caught with your back against the wall going, oh my God, the world's falling apart and I don't know what to do. Nope. You know what I'm going to do the day the world falls apart? Same thing I did the day before. I'm going to wake up. I'm going to have gratitude for that day. I'm going to have gratitude for the fact that I'm probably waking up with the girl of my dreams. You know, I'm going to go through the laundry list of things that I know are good about that day. And then I'm going to wake up and find out, oh, well, shit, something weird's going on. Well, that's okay. Because the good news is I've dialed into the things that I'm grateful for. I'm dialed into the things that I know sustain me. I'm dialed into the things I know I'm prepared for. And if somebody goes, well, you can't drive because you don't have a vaccine passport and we're not letting people to the gas pump if you don't have a vaccine passport. Well, guess what? I ride at 18 miles an hour. I'll get there slower, but I'll still get there. Oh, yeah, brother. Well, I'm excited to get there with you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's what this is about. And, and, and that's why I think the more we can actually get to a place where there's nothing to fear. Nothing. Like, I got the contingency for the contingency for the contingency, but I don't think that way. My way is going, hold on a minute. Who am I? What is the thing that this body represents? What's the spirit that this represents? What's the soul that this represents? What's the energy that I steward? And how do I use that to make sure... At the end of whatever the end is, 
I get that wonderful statement, well done, good and faithful servant. You were entrusted with a lot. You made a lot more. Why not? Hell yeah. I love you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> it's been fucking awesome getting to know you and learn it's from you. It's so cool. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that's, uh, that's good for us. We're at an hour and 15. We got plenty more to discuss in uh, upcoming podcasts. And I'm excited that you're out here in Austin and excited to, to see more of you. Absolutely. We're going to be here a lot more. We love you guys. And, you know, I, I'm just grateful. We keep, we keep referring to last night, but I'm grateful that there are enough people who are willing to actually say it's time for us to use that thing that we have. You know, whatever that talent is that we were given, whatever that special skill that we have, whatever it is, that room last night, gosh, packed with goodness. And if all we do is just link that energy up, man, we're a dynamo that can't be stopped. 100%, brother. All right, man. Thank you, my brother. Till next time. 